Hi everyone. In this video, I'd like to tell you about a very versatile, very useful practice tool called tetrachords. And that's just a fancy word for finger patterns. Tetra meaning four, four fingers, a pattern of four fingers. And it's basically a different configuration of half steps and whole steps. And if you practice the basic four tetrachords, it can improve a lot in your technique. And it, you can use these tetrachords to target certain weaknesses in your technique. Let me list some of the uses of tetrachords, and then I'll tell you more specifically what they are. And then I'll describe the exact applications that you can do whether you're a beginner or an advanced violinist. These are powerful because they're simple. And because they're simple, they can be very targeted. So number one, tetrachords can be used to improve your intonation. Number two, they can be learned to master your positions or your fingerboard geography. Number three, everything left hand. You can use tetrachords to help you correct bad habits such as squeezing or tension, especially when you're playing fast. We all start to tighten up a little bit when we start playing faster. Tetrachords can help you to overcome that habit. Tetrachords can help your left hand speed. It can help your left hand coordination and de dexterity. It can help your left hand to achieve better articulation. They're, they're, they're powerful. It can help you coordinate your left hand with your right hand. If you've ever been told that your two hands aren't quite together or they're not quite in sync, tetrachords can help you correct that. Um, it can help you work on your detaché. I have another video describing common errors made in a detaché stroke. People think detaché is easy and we take it for granted a lot. So you could use tetrachords to just spiff up or dust off your detaché, you can use tetrachords to work on spiccato. And that's just what I jotted down off the top of my head. So that's six major areas that you can use tetrachords in. So now let me just specifically tell you what tetrachords are. I told you they're a finger pattern. There are four common tetrachords. Beginners start by learning a half step between two and three. And that's why the tapes on a beginner's violin has the first finger tape here, second finger tape there, third finger tape right next to it, and fourth finger tape there. It's teaching this tetrachord. And there's lots of reasons for that, but it's just this seems to be the easiest. And most beginner songs are in a key that favors this tetrachord. Okay, so then the, the other, the next tetrachord we, we learn is we learn low two. And so then we're working in this type of tetrachord. And then after we master that, we learn the high three tetrachord. So this whole step comes back, that whole step comes back, and we're playing with a high three, and that's the half step between three and four. And sometimes we are required to play in a tetrachord that's all whole steps. Usually that's because the half step is hiding between open string and first finger. Okay, so this is the fourth tetrachord. So that's the basic four. Now let me tell you specifically the exercises you would use to achieve those things that I listed at the beginning of this video. So for intonation, you would get a tuner, the kind with the, the needle on it, or with the, the green light when you're in tune, and start with just this tetrachord on every string and teach yourself slowly with like half notes to get the green light on every note in that tetrachord, on every string. That would be a huge achievement. Then you can start trying to play the notes faster, like only give yourself a quarter note to dial it in and to get that green light. Then you can try eighth notes. So you're learning to be precise and accurate faster and faster. Okay, um, and that's in first position on all four strings. Eventually, you'll want to do that same work in all the positions, starting in maybe third position or whatever order you learn the positions in. Okay, so that's intonation. <clears throat> For position mastery and learning your positions, um, it's more 
rather than using tetrachords, it's more a, a matter of observing what the tetrachord is. So I like to have my students do an exercise to teach them their fingerboard geography. And this comes from Galamian's scale system. It's not my invention, but they'll play no sharps and no flats. So the key of C major, and they'll start on the lowest string and they'll play up to fourth finger on the highest string. So they're not playing a scale because we're starting on G, but we're in the key of C. And if you play all natural notes, no sharps and no flats, then you observe that the tetrachords are this on the G string, that on the D string, that on the A string, and that on the E string. Watch, I'll prove it to you. See that tetrachord? And then we'll play open D again. F natural. So there's that tetrachord, because F natural was low two. A, B, C natural. Okay, low two. And then E, F natural. All whole steps, E, F natural, G, A, B. So you would memorize and you would observe that your tetrachords in the key of C in first position are this, 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 and that. <clears throat> and it's surprising how quickly you can retain that and master that for every position, for every key. And then you're a wizard with your fingerboard geography. So that's number two position mastery, and fingerboard geography. Number three is the big one. <clears throat> Starting with left hand form or correcting bad habits, I like to use two types of exercises in conjunction with tetrachords. And they're inventions of mine. I, I've named them reps and compressions. Um, reps is repetitions of the same note. So let's say we're starting with this tetrachord, and let's say you have a screwy left hand that likes to come under like this, and you want to correct it. Or let's say that you're, you have a habit of squeezing and you need to correct it. So you'd start by playing four reps on every note on, let's say the E string, because the E string is really hard to not do the S curve on. So you're going to work on the E string with this tetrachord, playing four reps on every note like this. You do it four reps for as, as long as you want to. I usually have my students do just one cycle in four reps, and then they go to two reps. And they do it twice. Then they do single reps, four times. Three, four. <clears throat> um, but if you can't successfully get through four reps, then you might want to sit on four reps for a while until you're, you feel comfortable with that. Then sit on two reps for a while. Three reps is, three reps will work as long as you're not playing with a metronome. If you're playing with a metronome, it messes up the the math. Um, so you could include three reps, and that would look like this, starting with four reps. Then keeping the same speed, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then two. And then one. So you can do three reps if you like. I like to do three reps, but once you start introducing the metronome with it, you have to leave it out. Okay, so that's, if you use that and you do it on all four strings and you try to do it quickly, I was only doing it just now at about 69. You could do 60, 69, whatever, and then try to get it faster. It gets much harder when you're going faster and you'll start to, your, your bad habits will start to creep in. And the challenge is to override those bad habits because it's such a simple exercise. Learn to play as fast, so stressfully fast, but staying cool as a cucumber. So that can really help you to correct bad left hand habits or 
establish good left hand habits. Um, okay, so now left hand speed and dexterity or coordination of the left hand. By the time you work through all four tetrachords on all four strings, your left hand is going to have much greater finger speed and coordination because you're asking it to play in different configurations and that's going to improve your left hand. Always when you do it with a metronome, it adds steroids to the exercise. <laughs> I shouldn't use that analogy. Um, it makes the exercise more powerful when you can do the metronome. Some of my students just are metronome challenged and so I tell them it's better to do the exercise without the metronome than to not do it at all. So metronome is optional. Okay, so um, you can do reps to build your left hand speed and dexterity or you can do what I call compressions, which is just the opposite. We start with long notes like half notes. <laughs> I'm only playing one note per bow. Now, that was half notes. Now I'm going to slur two quarter notes per bow. And I'm going to do it twice. Now, I'm going to slur four eighth notes per bow. And I'm going to do it four times. Okay, you could even go up to 16 if you wanted to, but usually I just have my students speed up the metronome so that by the time they're doing at a metronome speed of 120, those slurring eights are really, really fast. Okay, so that's the exercise I call compressions. That's where you do one half note per bow, then you slur two quarter notes per bow so it's twice as fast, then slur four eighth notes per bow, then slur eight sixteenth notes per bow. All right, so for left hand speed and dexterity, you can use reps and compressions. They're both good for that technique. Now for left hand articulation, compressions. You don't have to do reps for your left hand articulation because basically what are compressions? They're slurs. You're slurring. And if you don't have good good strong um, finger action, then you're going to have muddy, muddled, soggy playing it's because your bow is not helping you on compressions or in slurs. It's all the left hand that is doing the enunciating. So for if you have a soggy um, or inarticulate left hand, work on tetrachords, all four fingers, all four strings, all four patterns using compressions. And of course the metronome always helps. Okay, so then what did I say? Um, left and right hand coordination. If you have the issue where your hands just aren't quite ever in sync or you have a difficult passage where they're not together, spend some time doing uh, tetrachords in reps. Compressions won't help you with with the left hand right hand coordination do reps um and n use a metronome with this because you need you need a boss the metronome will be the boss of both hands they both need to be dead on with the metronome and start slowly and listen carefully for absolute cleanness absolute synchronicity and then speed the metronome up one click at a time and it will come one other tip about getting the left hand and right hand in sync is to accent slightly with your bow arm on, on the beat. So that would be one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a... And that's easy when you're doing four reps. But when you start doing two reps, one E and a two E and a one E and a two E and a one E and a two E and a one, it gets harder. And then when you're doing singles, 
It takes a little bit of focus and cognition on your part to keep track of where the beat is. But train your bow to accent the beat. And that kind of helps to snap the left hand into the interface of the tempo that you're playing in. In my opinion, when your hands aren't together, you need to put your bow arm in charge and make the left hand obey the bow. Because what's your bow? Your bow is your rhythm. Your bow is your tempo, it's your speed. The left hand is your pitch. So it, you need someone needs to be in charge. And if it's not the metronome, then it's the bow hand. <clears throat> so we're almost done. Number five, detaché work. If you use reps, paying attention to your detaché technique. And if you're not sure what the technique is with detaché, find my video on detaché and how to practice it. It's very enlightening. Um, so you can use reps to clean up your detaché, simple exercise, and you can use reps to improve your spiccato. And you can work on spiccato with various speeds. Just choose a different speed every day. Choose a different place in the bow that you want to master each day. Do you want to master your brush spiccato? Or do you need to master your more natural mid-bow spiccato? Okay, so thanks for sticking with me through this long uh, video. I hope it was worth your while because this exercise, you can really tailor it to any need that you have. And it can help you to, without learning a whole etude and spending time learning notes, it can help you work on a technique very simply. Okay, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.